Hi, this is Stephanie Olson. You're listening to a message from Set Me Free Ministries. Join me as I teach on forgiveness from our renewed, restored, released event. I have to tell you a little story. My daughter, Tessa, was mad at my husband, Eric, and I once. Uh, we, I have no idea why. She was five years old at the time, and she decided she was going to run away. And I'm going to show you some pictures because I think you have to... <laughs> okay. <laughs> In order to really get a full grasp of this story, you have to know Tessa. And we actually, Nikki and I were talking, you have to call her the Tessa because this, she just has that personality. She's, she's just this creation on her own. I don't know. It's, it's she something. is probably one of the most precocious little girls that I've ever met. And she's full of these facial expressions and she's just, she is just so funny. But she took a backpack and she was going to run away and she loaded everything that you might need to run away, like a handful of ponytail holders and, and a bunch of toys. And she may have had a couple outfits or two. I'm pretty sure there was no underwear in there because moms notice those kind of things. But she decided she was going to run away to our swing set in our backyard. And it was like a 9 o'clock on a summer night, so it was kind of dark. And I said, you know, Tessa, honey, I don't want you to run away, but if, if you feel this is something you must do, I just want you to know it's, it's dark and there might be some bugs and it's kind of chilly out there. So without saying a word, she went and grabbed a jacket, a fly swatter, <laughs> and headed out back. And we have, our swing set, we have these massive spider webs and spiders that make these huge webs at night. They go from like our tree to the swing set. And so I watched her walk all the way around. She, here she's backpack, fly swatter, and sweater, walking all the way around the swing set, trying to figure out, what do I do? See a bunch of spider webs. So she came back inside and I said, so what's going on? Are you not, are you, I thought you were running away. And she said, you know, I decided I'm just going to sleep here for tonight. <laughs> and then I'm going to move in with grandma. <laughs> I, I think that is what we're like. We're kind of like Tessie, Tessie, Tessie. You make, you make these decisions and then you think maybe I was a little too hasty. You get mad and you get upset and you think mm, maybe I'm going to take it back a little bit. And that's what, that's what my Tessie teaches me all the time. You can go ahead and flip. As cute as she is, we could look at her all day, couldn't we? We're going to spend this afternoon talking about forgiveness, and we're going to get into the heart of it, because I think it's important to know how to forgive. I mean, we've talked about some pretty deep issues with sexual abuse and, and things like that, and knowing how we forgive, that is so tough. But before we dive into the scripture, I want to talk about some of the misconceptions of forgiveness. I want to talk about what forgiveness is not, because I think it's important that we debunk some of these things. First of all, forgiveness is not a feeling. I think there are a lot of misconceptions that when you forgive somebody, you're going to feel, oh, just feels so wonderful. I love that person again. It's just this, you know, and what happens, I think, is you, you, you forgive somebody and then you see them again and all of those feelings rise up and you're like, oh, I thought I forgave that person. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision and it's a choice and those feelings don't wash away immediately. That probably will never not happen. I've seen God do some pretty miraculous things, and there are times when it might. There are times when people forgive, and instantly it's gone. But most of the time, you have to deal with a lot of that stuff. And, and what they have found is, you know, when somebody hurts you, whether they do it on purpose or whether they do it accidentally, I mean, there are times when somebody hurts you, and they really don't know they've hurt you. And so... Forgiving them can be, can be difficult because, you know, to go to them and say, hey, you know, sometimes they do not know. So you get this series of feelings, hurt, 
frustration, rejection, anger, all of that stuff can occur. Now, I do want to say, none of that stuff is bad or sinful. You've heard people say things like, Christians shouldn't get angry. I've actually heard people say, Christians shouldn't get angry. Anger is not a sin. The Bible says, do not sin in your anger. It's those behaviors that follow the feeling that is the problem sometimes. And one of the things, you know, people who have been sexually abused, we talked about this morning, the hurt is so deeply intense. The shame, the pain, the rejection, the guilt, all of that stuff, you will see some people turn that inward. And as Jen said today, become victims in their own lifestyle. They turn it inward and they, they live a life of, of victimization, feeling horrible their entire life. Yet some people, same experience, can go through with life, living a life that is filled with victory. What is the difference there? What is the difference? It's the decision to forgive. That is the difference. Now, those, angers, those feelings of anger may still be there. That may not go away right away. But as you change your behavior, your feelings ultimately follow. They've actually done studies where a smile, when you're feeling depressed, if you smile, there are actually emotion, an emotional re, or a, a, an emotional reaction, yeah, a physiological reaction of happiness. Isn't that odd? All you have to do is smile, and you actually have your body triggers this physiological reaction of happiness. All right, what forgiveness is not, number two. Forgiveness is not always forgetting. We've all heard the term, just forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. Well, in the original Greek, the word forget means to cease to care. It doesn't mean that you don't really remember it anymore. Dictionary.com's de definition is to disregard. It's not that we don't remember it happened. It's not that we bury it deep inside. It's not that we pretend it doesn't exist. It's that we disregard it. We let it go. We don't hold it over somebody's head anymore. And that's what, that's what forgetting ultimately is. It's not that it's no longer there. It's that we disregard it. Romans 12, 14 tells us to bless those who persecute you. And overnight, but over time, those feelings go. God can truly change your heart on those things. So our third, what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not, not excusing the action. This is so important. I think so often people think, you have to hit it again. I think so often people think that when we forgive somebody, it's like saying what you did is okay. It is not true. You don't have to say that. People need to be held accountable for what they did. It is okay to forgive someone who committed a crime against you and want them to pay for that crime. That's okay because people need to be held accountable. But we are not judge and jury. God is a God of justice. He is a God of righteousness and justice. And I promise you, he takes care of all that. Maybe not in the way we want, but he is a God of justice, and he wants the best for his people. He truly does. Forgiveness is not always allowing that person back in your life. Sometimes you need to love people from a distance. You know what I'm saying? I think that's very important sometimes. When someone hurts us, we may not be best friends with them. We may not communicate with them. It is really important that certain things, you would never ask a rape victim to spend time with her rapist. That's not safe, and it's not smart. And God would never ask us to do something like that that is unsafe for us. It's not always allowing the person back in our life. This is where we're going to dive into Scripture, because the Bible talks about this very thing. 
And Jen actually touched on um, this scripture a little bit today, and we're going to dig deep. We're going to go to Matthew 18, 21, 34. If you want, if you have your Bible, open it. Great. If you don't, there are some Bibles under your chair. If you just want to sit and listen, by all means, I'm going to read to you. Matthew 18, starting at 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should, not, should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So this is an extremely important parable because it showed forgiveness in a whole new light in the Jewish law. Clearly, Peter is asking this question because somebody had done something wrong to him. And it's important to know that in Jewish law, that you should forgive a man three times. And then after the third time, you were released from your commitment to forgive. And it literally says, if a man transgresses one time, forgive him. If a man transgresses two times, forgive him. If a man transgresses three times, forgive him. If a man transgresses four times, do not forgive him. So when Peter was saying, hey, Jesus, I'm going to say, should I forgive my brother seven times? He thought Jesus was going to turn around and be like, oh, Peter, super good. Yes, that's great, because three is the answer. Wow, you're compassionate. But Jesus looked at him and said, 70 times seven, which is just in Jesus' way of saying an unlimited amount of times. There is no amount. So back to our story, this king is settling accounts. Isn't that what we do? Do we settle accounts? Do we keep a record? Okay, here's my account book, and so and so. Yep, I've got it here. Just in case every once in a while we need to pull that out and just say, hey, yeah, right here. That's what you owe me, by the way. We keep accounts, and that was, that's what the king was doing. He was settling accounts. Now, I want to fill you in on how much 10,000 talents is because it's important to the story, and this is some of the stuff that if you don't know the history, it doesn't make as much sense to you. 10,000 talents, one talent is 15 years wages. One talent was 15 years wages. So 10,000 talents is 150,000 years wages, okay? So let's say today uh, a wage is $15,000 a year. So that's $8 an hour at a minimum wage. That is $2,250,000,000 in the U.S. That's a lot. That's at minimum wage. So that's what that servant owed his master. And the king forgave the debt because he could not pay. That was something he could not pay. I want to interject something here. If you were raped, that rapist cannot pay you back. Even if... He had the most brutal death on the face of the earth. He can't pay you back. If you've been abused, your abuser cannot pay you back. Does not have the ability to pay you back the shame 
and the hurt they have caused you. That's impossible. If a spouse or someone's betrayed you, they do not have the ability to pay you back what it feels like to be betrayed. They don't have that ability. No human can pay you back. And that is why closure in courtrooms does not work. People go to courtrooms to feel this closure and they, they want to see um, horrific crimes that were committed against them and their families and, and the justice done. And they walk away typically feeling very dissatisfied because closure can't happen in that terms. Humans cannot pay you back. No revenge on any level can pay you back. Only Jesus, only Jesus can pay you back the debt that was caused you. All right. So the king was moved with compassion, and he released him, and he forgave him the debt, and the servant goes out and finds someone who owes him 100 denarii. And we're going to take a look at what 100 denarii is, because one denarii is one day's wages. So 100 days' wages, which is not, you know, I've heard people say it's like 20 bucks or something like that. It's like $5,000. So it's a decent debt, but it's a debt that certainly could be repaid. So here he was forgiven a $2 billion debt, and somebody owes him $5,000, and he locks him up, and throws him in prison. <sighs> hmm. So what do we see here? Those of you who are in Christ, what have you been forgiven? What has Jesus forgiven you? Psalm 103.12 says, He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know about you, but I have been forgiven an awful lot. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. That's not disregarding, by the way. He blots it out. He blots it out. All because Jesus died on the cross for you. So what does the king do when he finds out the servant has done that? Well, he's pretty upset. And he sends him to torturers. Now that's a little confusing because <clears throat> is the implication that if you are in Christ, then um, you don't forgive somebody, you're sent to torturers, you lose your salvation? because that has been questioned. What I would offer you, I want to think about a time, you could think about a time when you were consumed by hatred, by unforgiveness, maybe even by a small offense. Is that not torture? I know there are some of you in this room today who are holding on to unforgiveness so tightly because it is so painful to give it up. I get that. I get it hurts, but it is torture. You are being tortured holding on to that. It's torture. When you are consumed by hatred for someone, when bitterness consumes your daily life, it seeps into every area of our being, and it's like, it's like putting on rose-colored glasses that are not rose-colored, that are colored with hatred and bitterness. Everything in your life is filtered through those glasses. Everything. You see life through anger and unforgiveness, and it is torture. And Jesus does not want us to live that way. So how do we forgive? Okay. Well, forgiveness is an action. We make a decision that we're going to forgive. And then we behave in a loving way. That sounds painful too, doesn't it? But that doesn't necessarily mean, again, that when we're behaving in a loving way, that we're embracing this person, that we're bringing them into our life. It just means we are not holding it over our, their head. We're not cursing them. We're not letting it consume us. Forgiveness is letting go. 
You know, you can almost consider forgiveness a selfish act. For those of you who are holding on so tightly, consider it selfish. Because in a sense it is. There are going to be times when someone hurts you, as I said, that they don't even realize it. There's going to be times when someone hurts you and they don't even care. So when you're holding on to that forgiveness, unforgiveness, and they don't know they've hurt you, or they don't care that they've hurt you, who is that unforgiveness hurting? Is it hurting them? It's only hurting you. God tells us to forgive, and it's not just to punish us, <laughs> make it hard for us. Here, I want you to follow me, so I'm going to make it really difficult for you. But when we harbor unforgiveness, we get sick, we get bitter, we get angry. It interferes with our relationships with others. It interferes with our relationship with Christ. God never tells you to do something that is not the best for you. And let me tell you, God is never going to ask you to do something that you don't have the ability by grace to do. That is so important to know. I have certainly struggled with forgiveness in my life. I had a biological father who left me when I was one years old. I hated him. I was married to a man bad, ugly marriage, we got divorced, I ended up hating him. But I had to forgive both of them to move on with my life. You know, my biological father left me. That was not my fault. I had no choice in the matter. My bad marriage, I was culpable. I, I played a part in that. But I had to forgive them both. And the fact that whether you were an innocent victim or whether you played a role does not change the need for forgiveness. It does not change it. You know, what was even harder for, for me, for years I hated myself. My self-hate manifested into sin and, and alcoholism and things that were just really, really painful and bad for me. And before I could forgive those who hurt me, I had to receive that forgiveness from Christ. I had to allow him to cover me with his forgiveness, and I had to receive it. Because let's face it, unless you've received something, you can't give it away. If somebody asked me right now for a plate of pancakes, as much as I would love to give you a plate of pancakes, I could not give you a plate of pancakes because I do not have a plate of pancakes. If you have not received forgiveness for yourself, you can't give it away. Some of you may not be angry with a person. Some of you may be angry at God. When Eric and I decided to start our family, we had it all planned out. We knew, we knew, we knew. We are kind of type A personalities, and uh, we're planners, and we have everything we used to. <laughs> we learned our lesson. Have everything down to the minute. And so when we decided we were going to have a family, we knew, you know, this is when we're going to have our family. This is, I mean, I think we probably, you know, let's have, let's have a, a girl first. And then, I mean, we really thought we had it under control. And it was kind of like, you know what, God, we got this all taken care of. Thank you for your help. We're good. And so that was our plan. We got pregnant and we were happy. And when I was five months pregnant, I went in for a routine doctor's visit and they couldn't find a heartbeat. And I was devastated. I didn't understand. I thought we had done everything right. Things were going well. We were happily married. And I had to go into the hospital and deliver a little baby boy that fit into the palm of my hands. And I did not understand it. And we waited for about two years before we decided to try again. And we had our little girl, Noelle, who won that door prize. There she is, right, waving her hand. <laughs> And we were absolutely blessed with an uneventful pregnancy and a beautiful blessing, um, and, and she, she was and she is. 
And so because we had no well, and this is probably important to know, because we had no well, we decided to have more. You've met Tessa. <laughs> we decided to have more, and we, <clears throat> we got pregnant again. And when I was 11 weeks pregnant, went in for a regular ultrasound and no heartbeat again. And I thought, oh my, I can't do this again. I cannot do this again. And we decided to try again. We did. We got past it. My third miscarriage at eight weeks, another one. Now the first two, I will tell you, I was drinking, and so I drank the grief away. But the next two, I was sober, and I had to really deal with the pain of the miscarriages. I was blown away, I was devastated, and I was angry, but I didn't realize it. And I remember one day I was running on my treadmill and I was watching TV and I, I felt God gently speak in my spirit and say, I want you to turn off the TV and I want you to yell at me. Well, that is clearly not God because that seems a little inappropriate. So I kept running and I heard it again. And so I turned the TV off and I started praying and all of a sudden I started yelling and I thought, God, what are you doing to me? Why, why are you doing this to me? What did I do wrong? And I just yelled. I yelled for five minutes, just telling him how unfair he was, how upset I was. I've been good and you're doing this to me. I told him how angry he was, how angry I was at him. And all of a sudden, I just felt discomfort wash over me. I just felt this release and this covering. It's okay. It's okay. You know what? You can tell God you're angry. He can take it. He can take it. He already knows. You might as well be honest with him. Let him know how you feel. Give him your hurt and pain. Give it to him. He wants to comfort you. He loves you. God does not give us bad things in our life to punish us. He does not give us bad things at all. That is Satan job, Satan's job. But he does allow bad things to happen. There is sin in this world. There is free will. People make really bad choices. People make evil choices. There is death and pain. But that is not God. I need you to know that. That is not God. He allows us to go through it. But listen to me, dear ones. You do not have to go through it alone. You do not have to go through it alone. He will walk with you every step of the way if you let him. He desires to hold you in your time of need. And I said this before, what Satan intends for our harm, God can use and turn it into good. And he can turn it into something that glorifies him. Only God can do that, but you have to let him. I want to show you something in Daniel before we close that is so, so important. Daniel 3, and we're going to start at verse 9, but before we do that, I want to set the story up for you really quick. During the day of Daniel, idol and pagan worship was very prevalent, and there were very few that were truly committed to God. And King Nebuchadnezzar, the the king of Babylon at the time, set up a degree that at a certain time when horns and flutes were, were sounded, everybody would have to bow. Bow to this golden image that Nebuchadnezzar himself had created. And if they didn't bow, they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. So no pressure. Okay, so we're going to start reading at Daniel 3.9. 
They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your guards or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time... You hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music. You fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast these three men Bound into the midst of the fire, they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Let me point out a few things. First of all, they did not bow. It is so easy to bow bow to the pressure of this world, bow to the idea that there are other ways to get to heaven than Jesus, bow to addiction, bow to insecurity, bow to offenses. It is easier to bow. But they didn't bow. And of course, at first, it didn't look good. Their consequences didn't look so great. They got worse. They were given one more opportunity to bow or they'd be thrown into the furnace. Imagine that pressure, really. Imagine what kind of pressure that was. But they said, if that is the case, our God whom we, are able to, who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And then they go on to say, but if not, we will not bow. They had the faith that God would deliver them. It wasn't that they were saying, our God might not deliver us, but they understood our God might not deliver us in the way that we would prefer. But they knew that God would deliver them. And then the fires turned up seven times hotter. Isn't that the way it always is? We think it's bad, and then it's seven times hotter. And we think, oh my gosh, we're not going to make it. And the guys who put them in the fire were killed. That's some tough boss right there. Seven times hotter, and then God. And then God. And I want to point something out, too. The only thing that was burned on those men were the ropes that bound them. 
And who was in the fire with them? Jesus. Jesus. You know what? The fires in your life may not go away. It may get seven times hotter. But Jesus is in the fire with you. Your deliverance comes in the fire, not out of the fire. Your deliverance comes in the fire, but Jesus is with you in the fire. He is with you in the fire. Praise God. He loves you, and he wants the absolute best for you. I promise you that. He wants you to have peace, and he wants you to have joy. And God forgives us because of that sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. He took upon the entire burden upon himself for you. Because of the blood of Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, we can be cleansed. And 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess, we receive, we are cleansed. You've got to receive his forgiveness. You've got to let go of that shame and that, that, that pain and give it over to him because he can handle anything you give him. Our Jesus can handle it. I want to read you something a Christian author, his name is Francis Fran Japan, wrote. He said, Unfortunately, the enemy has many Christians trapped in unbelief and self-condemnation. They know what they did was wrong, and they hate it. But they could not unburden themselves of the guilt. Remember, our Redeemer came to proclaim liberty to those who are prisoners. Is he speaking only of those who are incarcerated in jails? No, his mission is for all of us who are prisoners of our past failure. God wants us to learn from our mistakes, not be held captive to them. Jesus came to deliver and restore those whose dreams lie buried in condemnation. What are you holding on to today? What do you need to release? Who do you need to forgive? What ropes are still binding you today? What's preventing you from moving towards total freedom? Give it to him today. The Set Me Free Ministries team is going to show you what God did for them. Each of us have something that we've been able to release to God, and he's provided victory, whether victory where we're free from it or victory that we're still working on. And I want you to think about what you need to release. I want you to think about what you're holding on to. Maybe unforgiveness towards a person. Maybe some, somebody that keeps coming to your mind. Maybe it, it's not hard to, to remember who that is. I want you to pray about it while we're doing this. Watch what we're doing. Pray about it. And we're going to have sheets of paper on the table for you. There should be sheets of paper for each of you. And when we're done, Kristen is going to guide you into what we, we're going to do next because we're going to release them at the foot of the cross today. You don't have to put your name on it. Just put what you want to release. God knows who you are. And I just want you to release whatever you need to release today.